So today I'm going to talk to you about a large compressible MHD turbulence simulation. I originally said the world's largest, but I thought that that was kind of tacky. This is just a large compressible magnet, and with no net magnetic flux. I want to make sure this is highlighted, so you know maybe you can't apply these Goldrick and Schrader ideas here. And I'll show you, you perhaps cannot actually. Okay, so this is all from a paper in prep, supersonic uh, magnetic turbulence extreme Reynolds numbers. And really what I want to convince you today is well, first I want to show you what a simple cascade looks like, a Kolmogorov type cascade in my mind, just kind of a painted a simple picture of it. And then I want to show you what a cascade from a large MHD simulation looks like. And you'll see that these things are very different. Turbulence, ubiquitous in the universe. I'm not going to say of all the astrophysical processes, all, all the different parts of the universe that are we know. We've been at this conference for a whole week. We know that all parts of the universe are turbulence. So what is turbulence? And like I said, I'm going to paint this in a very hand waverly way, but no one has done this so far, so I thought we should go to the basics. Well, here's momentum conservation for a fluid element. And what you see are a number of stresses. You see the Reynolds stress and you see the viscous stress, okay? Now, in my mind, the Reynolds stress is really just a nonlinearity in the, in the fluid plasma and the uh, viscous stress is an operator that smooths out nonlinear things in the plasma. So you kind of have a competition between nonlinear things being developed and nonlinear things being smoothed out. And the ratio between these things we call the fluid Reynolds number. So, you know, a lot of the time we use this tilde relation, but this comes from this. This is what the Reynolds number is. It tells us for large Reynolds number, the nonlinearity is strong, and for the small Reynolds number, the viscous stresses are strong. So let's play a little game here. Let's consider two waves and we're going to essentially just put them through this nonlinear operator and just say momentum is conserved. And when we do that, we see we take one K-mode, another K-mode, and we create a third K-mode, and that is a higher wave mode than the previous two through momentum conservation, and that is what the cascade is. So we keep doing this, we keep winding this handle, and we're generating new higher wave modes, and they're all happening on this nonlinear time scale associated with the Reynolds stress. Let's apply this to a galaxy. Start on the outer scale of the galaxy, KPC scales, in the warm um, interstellar medium. Reynolds number 10 to the 7. So of course, Reynolds number 10 to the 7, nonlinear time is dominating here. So we generate new modes. And we keep doing this, we keep doing this, we keep doing this, we keep doing this, all the way through the cascade all the way down until we get to the, the sub AU scales. But our Reynolds number is shrinking. Our Reynolds number is shrinking as a function of scale. The velocity dispersion is shrinking, the length scales are shrinking, so our Reynolds number is shrinking. And when we get down to R equals one, this is where the dissipation scale lives. And if you just plug these values in and you pick a Kolmogorov cascade, what you get, if you pick an outer scale of one KPC, it's a thousand AU for the dissipation scale. This is the cascade. Everything I've said, but put into power, spectral space. So this type of cascade assumes incompressible hydrodynamical um, energy moving from large scales to the small scales. But what about shocks? Everywhere we look in the ISDAM are full, full, full with these high divergence um, explosions of energy as supernova blasts bubbles through the molecular clouds. What about magnetic fields? We see on the largest scales in the galaxy, turbulent magnetic fields um, on, on really large scales as far as we can see. So we have to add both of these things into the picture of the cascade. With, of course, with magnetic fields, we introduce a new Reynolds number, the magnetic Reynolds number, which is fundamentally the same thing, nonlinear things up here, uh, smoothing out nonlinear things down here. And with the magnetic Reynolds number and the Reynolds number, we can paint a landscape of RM and RE. Really turbulent things are up here. Really nonlinear magnetic field structures are up here. And this right now is the state of art simulations. They can probe. 10 to the 4 in RM and RE. Okay, and we can see just by painting on various astrophysical uh, plasmas that we are w really, really far away from getting any kind of Reynolds numbers equivalent to the astrophysical objects in the universe. So um, I, I guess with this slide, what I wanted to say is that the Reynolds number is the thing that sets the size of the cascade. So we want to go to really large Reynolds numbers, so we have very large cascades in our simulations, so we can actually represent these turbulent phenomena in the universe. Now this is exactly the uh, reason why I 
proposed this, uh, what, 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 why submitted this grant for a 100 million computer project on SuperMOOC NG. So this is a big supercomputer um, in Germany, going all the way up to 10,000 cubes, um, using around 80 million core hours for the simulations on 150,000 compute cores. Now, this simulation is Mach 4 on large scales, and I'm driving the turbines with my hand of God on the L over 2 mode, and all I have, like I said, is a turbulent magnetic field. There's no net magnetic field here at all. Okay? And what happens on large scales is it gets around MA2. This is fundamentally a small-scale dynamo um, simulation. So the, the, the field that is generated in this simulation is a small-scale dynamo field. So this is obviously a spherical cow, but it's my spherical cow. I love this cow. It's really simple, isothermal. So really what we're seeing in the simulation is the turbulence, right? It's just turbulence in the simulation. So in the, in the landscape of IRM and RE, you can make calculations based on the uh, numerical resistivity and numerical viscosity. This is the ILES, and you can put the simulation right there. So around 10 to the 6 RM and 10 to the 6 RE, and we can make this calculation very, really quite accurate from some beautiful work from Lakshmi um, doing numerical studies of our solver. Now, Axel might ask me, what about the uh, initial conditions for the magnetic field? Can you just put in any magnetic field into a simulation and come to some attractive state? Yes, you can. The small-scale dynamo handles this for you. You can put in a strong magnetic field. You can put in a saturated magnetic field. You can put in a weak magnetic field, and they all go to the same saturation due to the small-scale dynamo. So this is very nice. It gives me a, it means that I can um, set up my simulation any which way, and, I, and I'm guaranteed to get to the same saturation from the small-scale dynamo. So this is very nice. So now we're looking at the uh, turbulent Mach number as a function of time in the simulation, to, so you can kind of see what I'm doing here. Um, I've got three colours, 2,500 cubed, 5,000 cubed, 10,000 cubed. And what I do is I run my 2,000 cubed simulation for around two turnover times, and then I grab the initial conditions from that simulation, I use it, upscale, go to my next 5,000 cube, run that for a turnover time, that's all that's required to populate the, the high K modes, and then I re-simulate it again, and this is how I can, I don't need to waste time at 10,000 cubed anywhere in this burn-in stage, which is actually, you know, I can only get this amount of 10,000 cubed, only two turnover times, so that would completely uh, mess with my computation. So the alphanic Mach number, you can kind of see the same thing here. Um, you, you see actually a reduction, a slight reduction in the alphanic Mach number as they go up in tiers of resolution, and this is because the magnetic energy spectrum is intrinsically high K. So it, is a, it has different structures, in the velocity spectrum, it is dominated by high K modes, and as you resolve more of them, you go up in magnetic energy a little bit by little bit. But you get the you get the gist. So what does this simulation look like? Well, this is a gas density slice. It's hard to fit all on the same screen, so I'm just kind of doing this around the gas density slice. You can see these beautiful filaments. I mean, this is this is really strong divergence flow. I mean, you get these beautiful uh, the, the high density filaments are the yellow ones. Low density rarefactions are also yellowish green. So you get giant density contrasts by orders of magnitude in the supersonic turbulence. The magnetic fields, I mean, you can take a magnetic field through any orientation of the simulation. It just looks the same. It's isotropic. This is kind of what it looks like. It's full of O points, um, lots and lots of structure. The magnetic field gets draped around the shocks as they move through the simulations. It actually becomes quite large scale due to the uh, supersonic nature of the flow, quite different than the regular kind of small scale subsonic dynamos. Now, there are two important scales in this simulation. There is the transition between sub, uh, supersonic and subsonic, which should kind of mark a transition between the kinetic energy dominating from the large scales or the kinetic energy from the shocks and the subsonic scales, which um, we'll find out if they're dominated by the magnetic field or not. So I can measure this directly from the simulation. It's easy. Now, there's another scale. Of course, we have magnetic fields. And this is the alphanic scale. And what you find is that on the large scales, where all the shocks live, where the, uh, where the kinetic energy is strongest, you find that, of course, the kinetic energy is dominant. The magnetic field can't even grow on those scales. You get MA close to 10 on the large scales. Now, you get this nice K to the minus 1 spectrum um, in magnetic energy. So the kinetic energy is decreasing across scales, K to the minus 1. And then you get into this um, regime which is actually minimized right at the sonic scale, which is the most magnetized place. So this is the most magnetized place in the plasma where the, um, where the, the velocity transitions from supersonic to subsonic. And then you get to a MA1 regime. 
at IK. So there's a lot of interesting structure in here. You have multiple regimes of turbulence inside this box. Supersonic, subsonic, superalphanic, subalphanic, transalphanic. Let's go to the energy cascade. And I think this is all I'll have time to show today. The energy cascade is very interesting. So I'm going to focus first on this panel. This is uh, me compensating the energy cascade by k to the minus 2. And then this panel. So this is me compensating the energy cascade by k to the minus 3 half. So let's focus here first. So of course, we um, know from hydrodynamical turbulence that we should expect, if the flow is dominated by discontinuities, that we should get a k to the minus um, 2 spectrum. And this is simply taking the Fourier transform of discontinuities. Very easy to show. So for randomly oriented um, discontinuities on, on large scales, this is exactly what we expect. And it's kind of convincing. It's my least convincing spectrum, I would say. It's noisy up there. There's driving happening up there. It fluctuates. But we do see some flattening. Okay, And this kind of goes all the way up to the energy equipartition scale. So that is when you first cross over MA1. Now, um, let's go to the subsonic energy cascade. Very interesting, you get a k to the minus 3 halves. So k to the minus 3 halves over a very broad range of scales. I'd say this is the most convincing spectrum here. Um, so is this IK type turbulence? Is this dynamical alignment? We can actually test these things. So we can test these things. What do I mean by dynamical alignment? Well, the, obviously the, uh, the Kolmogorov picture or the Goddard and Schrader picture is you have a strong nonlinearity when you have delta V and delta V perpendicular to each other. So this creates a strong nonlinearity, and essentially you get the, the strongest nonlinear spectrum you can get, and it's minus five thirds, okay? But you can weaken that nonlinear spectrum. You can weaken it by changing the angle between V and B. So this is kind of the idea behind dynamical alignment. You update the nonlinear time scale with an angle between V and B, which weakens the spectrum and gives you a, um, a, a minus three half slope. Now, when I look at my V and B, um, surface, so this is a slice of VNB, I find that everything, or many things, are either V parallel or V anti-parallel with B. So I have a lots of alignment in this, in this turbulence. Lots and lots of alignment. And when I compute the PDF, the, the full 3D uh, PDF, this is the um, distribution function I find between V and B. It looks like there is a very strong preference for either being completely aligned or completely anti-aligned. And this should weaken the nonlinearity in the turbulence and result in a different cascade. Now, I can go a step further. I can actually test dynamical alignment specifically by computing the um, alignment as a function of length scale with this structure function. So there's a first order structure function. Um, you, you can see that you're just kind of probing the, uh, the angle between uh, delta B perp and delta V perp. And when I see perp, I mean, I construct a local magnetic field, and I work out the perpendicular component to the local magnetic field and the parallel component, and this is the perpendicular component. So I can test this. The prediction is um, L to the 1 quarter. Theta should go like L to the 1 quarter. And here is the result. So here's my structure function. And I actually get something that is shallower than the boulder of prediction for this type of turbulence. So here, here are all the supersonic scales. Here is the, uh, the subsonic scale. So this is in the subsonic cascade where I have that minus three halves, and I get a different um, alignment as a function of scale. So I do find scale-dependent alignment in this regime, but it is not dynamical alignment. It doesn't look like it. Okay? So this is very interesting already. Now we have to consider that this, that if, if you compute curvature PDF, so the blue PDF is, a, is, is the PDF of curvature for the magnetic field um, for supersonic turbulence. Sorry, I, I missed this label. This is supersonic, this is subsonic. And what you find is that the, the magnetic field has really organized itself into this folded magnetic field structure. So is this uh, a property of, thank you, a property of folded magnetic fields? We don't know yet. So this is kind of exciting. Understanding this better. Now, I, I'm still searching for what weakens the nonlinearities. It's not dynamical alignment. It's some kind of alignment. And what I'm showing here is J and B and V and B. And what I see everywhere in my turbulence is strong alignment between J and B and strong alignment between V and B. So there's some kind of, some kind of process that's making these quantities extremely aligned. And of course, this is important to understand the turbulence because this is the Lorentz force. The angle between J and B 
the fact that it is becoming parallel and anti-parallel is turning off the Lorentz force. And the angle between V and B is turning off the induction term in the induction equation. So this turbulence wants to get rid of its magnetic field. It doesn't want any induction. It doesn't want any Lorentz force. It wants to be hydrodynamical. Very, very interesting. So what does this sound like? Well, to me, it sounds like magnetic relaxation. So the main idea here is that you're, you're, I'm trying to search for a mechanism that is going to reduce my nonlinearities. And now we have a very nice theory for magnetic relaxation where you essentially define a constraint equation based on quadratic invariance in our MHC turbulence. So things that will stay the same all the time. And in this case, I'm saying that the, the total energy stays the same, the magnetic helicity stays the same, and the cross helicity stays the same. And uh, this is how you define those like, quantities right here. Okay? And if you, if you essentially um, perturb this to find the minimum energy state of the system while holding these constants, what you find is V is aligned with B, and J is aligned with B, and also the vorticity. So just being in a relaxed state, a minimum energy state, you get into these aligned, um, you get into this alignment between V and B and J and B. And this is very important for the kinetic spectra because this is exactly what we're finding. Now, I made this calculation. This is just an idea at the moment. You have essentially your alignment angle between delta B and delta V, and you want to know the dynamical time scale of that alignment. So how fast you can change your angle, because if you can change it really fast compared to the nonlinear time scale, then you should be able to get into a relaxation, start, uh, relaxation state faster than you can have the nonlinear turbulence kick you out of it. Okay, so this is the idea. And when we compute this, this uh, relaxation time scale as a function of leg scale, compare it to the nonlinear time scale, what we find is that we move into this subsonic cascade. You can relax faster than you can be perturbed out of the relaxation. So kind of a simple idea, I hope, but kind of interesting, right? It says that on, on these scales, you should be able to align faster than you're perturbed out of that, out of that, um, out of that uh, uh, minimum energy state. Another, th another thing you can test is you can, well, you can say, okay, well, what actually happens in, in this weird limit where I make that magnetic energy really strong to start off with? What is it, what, you know, I, I'm trying to just probe where the saturation, what, what's happening in the saturation. If I go beyond the saturation or if I go below the saturation. So this is going beyond the saturation. And what I find is that the turbulence becomes linear force free very, very quickly. And so this is, this is a, a perfect, essentially a perfect linear Taylor state. And by that, I mean, that the J and B alignment happens um, everywhere in the flow, and it happens with a single value of alpha. So a single, um, essentially, eigenvalue between J and B. So this is very cool. What we're seeing is that you become relaxed if you're strong enough, and then as you decay into the dynamo, you know, you get into this quasi-competitive state between relaxation and getting kicked out of the relaxation from the turbulence. I hope this makes sense. Um, so, to summarize, relaxation on small scales, maybe, the small magnetized scales, which then weakens your spectrum and gives you your minus three halves. This is the kind of idea that we're trying to understand right now. So, the supersonic cascade, I only got to talk about the kinetic energy. Burgers on large scales, relaxation plus turbulence on small scales. And to, sum, uh, to, to finish all up, I want to say that this is very different from this. Thanks. Oh, this is good. Um, um, I guess, you know, I have so many questions, everyone has to ask. Okay. So, yeah, so this new alignment mechanism, yep. uh, it doesn't seem that it depends on Mach number in any way. Uh, then it should be able, you should be able to test it in incompressible, low compressible simulations, right? I think so. If you ha what, what it depends upon is having in the forcing, which will kick you out of the relaxed state, and your dissipation, which will also n no longer conserve any of those invariants I was talking about. So you do have to have a large Reynolds number, I would say, but incompressible, no net magnetic flux, I think you should find relaxation. Uh, so all these, uh, this JS95 or Bodra theory, I think they established that when there's a mean magnetic field. Yeah. But your simulation, the center, right, these are dynamo simulations, right? They're not MHD simulations. Yep, that's Could right. Could you clarify? Yeah, I mean, this, to, in my opinion, is well, this, not, not the... Korean nebula. Um, you know, this is all fluctuating magnetic field. 
yeah. or fluctuating magnetic field. So when I am doing anything like computing dynamical alignment structure functions, then I'm just making sure I construct a mean magnetic field locally um, to, to compute the perpendicular component. But you're totally right. Am I completely justified to even make that structure function um, comparison with Boulder? I'm not too sure. I just want to make it, see what I got, see if, if there was the same alignment as a function of scale, and I don't find that model. I think something else is happening. Can I yeah. say something quick? I think a Federer's simulation suggests that dynamo saturation depends on sonic Mach number and the driving, but here you, 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 you suggest it's universal. It is. Well, yes, it's universal for a fixed, you're talking about my paper on the universality. It's, um, it's universal for a fixed set of plasma parameters. So you can move up and down in seed field or magnetic field amplitude and you find the same attractor state. And the saturation state still depends on the driving. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yep. Great talk. Uh, I just want to say that these observations of highly aligned with what we see in the solar wind. Oh, so, awesome. Um, and it's also sort of consistent with this idea of there's like a stationary frame if you have B and V aligned, meaning that you have basically, you know, the electric field is gone, so you yep. have very minimum you know, stationary, stable structures or waves or states. But uh, we should talk later, but it looks like the solar wind, so. Exciting. Hi. Um, I, Hi. I, I have a little bit of technical concern, which probably comes from my misunderstanding. Yep. Uh, can you go to the structure functions of angles? Oops. I'm sure you don't want to see my cow? Yeah. Cow is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm right here. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, maybe slide before. Mm -hmm. uh, one slide before. Oh, one slide before. Oh, the definition. Yeah, yep. be yeah because it, it looks for me that it's not a structure function, but correlation function, that you have a product of two quantities. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is just how I write, have written it down. Everyone writes it down like this. I am actually taking increments. You know, so it, it should be like a, an, an R here and then an R plus L of this whole term. I can get these locally first and then take all the increments like, like a usual structure function. Yeah, yeah because my, my concern was that the function are not very well defined for the spectrum and they will be all saturated by long wave mode. So if, use, if you start measuring, you also will use the same values at all scales. If you, do, if you use that formula as reader, I would say. Well, I mean, the only, I mean, I'm using this formula, but I'm taking increments of that whole quantity. Um, and when I do it this way, and the reason why I'm doing it this way is other people do it this way, and I wanted to make sure I compared apples with apples. That was that was the reason why I'm doing this. But uh, apples may be rotten, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that that is actually beyond the point, though. Be There's something to share. Right? No, no, that is beyond the point, though, because I want to make sure if I have this kind of alignment from what other people have measured, I want to just compare it with that. Regardless of if the apples are rotten or not, I want to compare apples to apples. Yeah, but, 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 the, but the fact that uh, it doesn't scale with L may be uh, the outcome of technical issues. Uh, no, it does scale with L. Mm -hmm. So the weakening of the nonlinearity yeah. due to the alignment alters the cascade rate. So what's it doing to the cascade rate in this simulation? As in, um, I haven't measured that. I haven't measured okay. the cascade. Uh, that's a yeah. real, real important thing to look at. Yeah. Also, yeah. do you see any plasmoids? Oh, yes, I do. But um, <laughs> so so this was, this is a, a really neat thing with these simulations, uh, something that isn't completely um, consistent with solar wind, I think. Uh, we get very different magnetic spectrum than velocity spectrum. So the magnetic spectrum is essentially a monofractal. Um, and you can see that the, the, the power law only develops at really, really high grid resolutions. And um, when I test this compared to, you know, these two different uh, reconnection models uh, for fast reconnection, like this is, um, I think, your reconnection one, reconnection two um, profiles for the plasma wind, um, I, I don't find it's consistent with any of those. But I do find it's consistent with Drummond's work, which was just a... Philip Griggs has showed it first. I was second. Oh, there you go. I didn't know that. Well, Philip's work. We're, we're... Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so this negative nine-fifths. And um, I do find plasmoids but they occupy such a small volume, I don't think they ever play a, um, a, a role in the cascade. You can see there's this like cute little plasmoid chain right here. And I do resolve it. I have around 100 grid elements on this particular plasmoid, but they so low volume filling that I don't think they participate in the volume average sense. Yeah. 
If you... Two, two minor technical... Oh, no, you were still answering his question. Go ahead. If you look on scales below where the alphanic Mach number is one, mm -hmm. so you there have, you know, a reasonably well-defined local magnetic field. Do you see the cascade become anisotropic? And look... No, I don't actually. So yeah. did you do perpendicular and parallel structure? Yeah, yeah, it looks isotropic. Okay. And I, I think it looks isotropic because the... Um, if, I, if I plot the unit vector of the magnetic field, it samples uniformly everywhere. So when I'm taking my... Um, Fourier space, it just is like, you know, I've got this, this sphere in K space and the unit vector's everywhere in it. So it always looks isotropic Interesting. in this regime. Thanks. Yeah. Just two small technical questions. Uh -huh. First, um, what were you, were you using to drive this? This is hand of God, K equals two mode, 50-50 compressible, incompressible on the lighter scales, Mach 4. Mach 4. Okay. Mach 4 and Alphane. Oh, well, it depends on what you're in. Alphane gets to 2 yeah. in the volume average sense, but then depends upon a function sure. scale, as I showed. Okay. And the second question was 3.5 petabytes. How did you compute structure functions? Did, was that a GPU calculation by itself? This is all CPU, and um, the structure functions are really expensive. I have to compute around 10 to the 13 pairs to get a converged structure function, and I'm just brute forcing it. It takes you know, 100 million, oh, sorry, 100,000 compute hours per structure function. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so uh, real quick, actually, sort of steep spectra in the magnetic field are pretty common in the solar wind, and we do associate them with the intermittency. Uh, and so, sorry, what in solar wind? Uh, so these, this K to the minus 9 fifths spectra. Oh, we, really? We, oh, yeah, these are fairly common. They're typically associated with the intermittently driven, like, coherent structures. So, Ooh. especially, and they're allowed to differ from the velocity fluctuation. So it's actually not inconsistent, I would say. That's really cool. Now I really need to chat with you. Negative nine fifths. This was a mystery to me. So very nice talk. Uh, and you framed your narrative around the, the spectrum of kinetic energy. How do you define it? Um, say it one more time, sorry. Say it one more time. Oh, how do you define your spectrum oh. of kinetic energy? Um, Okay, so that is the velocity spectrum. It is velocity okay. spectrum. Excellent, thank you. Uh, it's probably related to Elliot's question. And uh, are you measuring uh, the anisotropy in the local system of reference or in the global uh, reference system? And what is the scaling? Because I'm very confused when you're saying that at small scales you are getting isotropic. It, contradicts to whatever we know about uh, MHD. Yeah, I couldn't find any anisotropy. I looked for it locally and globally. I mean, globally, certainly no. But at small scales, at small scales. Even small scales, the, the magnetic field is just sampling at every angle. And, I mean, I, I don't find the anisotropy. You should talk with you. Yeah. Because, uh, it could I, be associated very... with the alignment as well. No, it should not be. Because yeah. uh, it's, like, a... it's not like we have eddies like this, right? It's like this. Yeah, well, if you have a, this, it means that you are moving by velocity or magnetic field. But if you are already at small scales mm. at MA equals 1, it cannot uh, move uh, with velocity. So uh, we should talk. Cannot move with velocity. But you shouldn't have it over small force or small force. Yeah, but the Hmm. Yeah, I couldn't find, find any anisotropy. I tried to make these calculations, and they were all just isotropic. Hmm. If you move it, uh, it will be blocks, yes, but if not, uh, hmm. it shouldn't. Okay. I think 